Yes. Yeah, that would be nice. Yes. Okay. Um, Everything looks fine. Okay, so I guess I can start. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here and thanks to organizers for inviting me. My name is Dario Sansone and today I will present some machine learning application in both education and development economics. Before doing that, let me just say a few things about myself. I received my PhD in economics from Georgetown University last year and I'm currently a postdoc at Vanderbilt University. And in a few weeks, uh, I will uh, actually start as assistant professor at the University of Exeter in the UK. And my research agenda is mainly centered around marginalized individuals and what can we do to help them, which policy can be implemented targeting these individuals. And within this broad research agenda, I mainly focus on women, but also LGBTQ individuals. And at the same time, I've also done several machine learning applications in both education and development economics. And when working on development economics, I mainly done that with co-authors at the World Bank. And at the end of these slides, you can see the link to my webpage, which I put not only for some shameless self-promotion, but also because uh, under resources, I have a web page specifically dedicated to machine learning, which I started mainly for myself, but then I realized that people found it useful, so I keep updating that. And on this webpage, you can find several resources uh, to begin to start if you're new, but also some new paper at the intersection between machine learning and economics as well as some application which I find uh, kind of interesting and cool. And if you're relatively new to this literature, I strongly suggest you to read this uh, journal economic perspective article by Bunanathan and Spies. And frankly, this is one of the few paper that I've read the whole online appendix very carefully because they really provide a lot of practical tips on how to actually implement and calibrate your own machine learning algorithms. And I'm also a big fan of uh, Susanetti's work, uh, and she has done a lot of presentation recently, both at the MBR, American Economic Association, and so on. And I, will, I have all the links on my webpage, then you can go and look at them. If instead you are mainly interested in development economics, I think the lecture that Esther Duflo gave a couple of years ago was very good in summarizing how machine learning could be used in development economics and especially in our cities. And almost all the papers that I'm going to present today are published, but if you have any trouble accessing my own paper, feel free to email me and I will send you the PDF. So as we have seen also in the previous webinars, uh, Machine learning is entering into economics in different ways. And today in my talk, I will mainly focus on the first bullet point, which is using machine learning in order to obtain accurate prediction and therefore solve policy relevant issues. I understand that in many cases, as economists, we are obsessed with obtaining causal estimate. We want to know if X affects Y, whether or not whether or not a certain program is effective. But in many cases, what we actually need is accurate prediction. For instance, we may want to know whether or not a certain program is effective at reducing dropout in high school or college. But I think we will all agree that the first step there is actually to identify which student are at risk of dropping out from high school or college. And that's where machine learning really is uh, optimal in doing that. Uh, as a policymaker, you may also be interested in knowing which individuals are eligible for certain social welfare program. And again, it's another way, another context in which machine learning can be used. And I know that this tool has been around for several years or even decades. 
but I think it's getting more momentum right now in economics because we are getting access to larger and larger data sets, not only in the US and in Europe, especially in Nordic countries where admin data are amazing, but more and more also in developing countries. And so machine learning really allow us to fully exploit these large data sets. So I will not talk instead today about the intersection of machine learning with economics and econometrics, mainly because uh, a couple of uh, previous uh, uh, seminar speakers have already talked about this. And I will also briefly mention how machine learning can be used in randomized control trial. And we saw that practically 10 minutes ago with the previous speaker. But also it's interesting that two days ago, Susanetti gave uh, another talk on adaptive film experiment uh, with the University of Chicago. And I think if you're interested, her talk will be updated on YouTube by University of Chicago in a few days. So you can have a look at that. So as I said, uh, in this talk, I will focus mainly on using machine learning to solve a policy issue to obtaining accurate predictions. And I think this short paper written in 2015 in the paper in proceeding of the American Economic Association really makes a good case for why this is important and give a lot of other uh, useful examples. If instead you are more interested in the intersection of machine learning and economics or econometrics. Guido Inbanks and Susanetti wrote several articles recently on these topics. And I think this one is the most recent one in which they give more or less a lot, an overview of where the field is going and which tool can be used by economists nowadays. And most of them, again, have been mentioned in the previous webinars. So to start the actual talk uh, today, I will present a couple of papers in development economics and then one of my paper in education. The first paper is actually not one of mine, but I think it's very interesting and worth discussing. Uh, this one was published in 2016 in Science and the author here combined machine learning with satellite data in order to predict poverty. So you may wonder why do we need this in the sense that we already conducted a census and national representative survey in order to measure poverty. We know how to measure that. The issue here is that in many developing countries, since this kind of survey are expensive, uh, they are not usually conducted for several years or even for decades. And so policymakers in those countries have to make decisions based on very limited data without actually knowing where the people that would benefit for, from certain welfare programs. And so one way to sidestep this issue is to use some alternative data set, such as uh, social media, mobile phone data, and in this paper in particular, they focus on satellite data. So the first kind of data that they use is night-like data, where this is just one example, usually it's a bit easier to translate in theta or R from the picture, but this kind of always blow my mind because you can clearly see South Korea and then the black part uh, is North Korea. So as this picture made clear and out of people have written paper about this uh, to make the case that nine likes data are a good proxy for economic activity. So what's the issue with using this data? Is that they are not very good at the extreme of the distribution with very high and very low light level. And especially in the pixel in the region with low level of light, you are not sure whether or not this region are below or above the poverty line. But we know that these uh, night lights data are proxy for economic activity. So what the author did is to combine daylight picture with night light data. And so try to understand the use in machine learning, which feature from uh, uh, certain picture taken during the day are most predictive of economic activity as proxied by satellite data, night light data. 
And then once they have calibrated this model, they combine this information with survey data whenever available in order to predict consumption or wealth in different African countries. And as you can see in this picture, the results are different in different countries. And on the y-axis, you have the predicted consumption, the y hat. And on the x-axis, you have y, the observed consumption. And the R squared is quite high across all countries and is higher than just using survey data. And so this paper was published uh, in 2016. They tried to predict both consumption and wealth and obtain very similar results. There is then a follow-up paper which was published this year, in 2020 in Nature, where they also use similar technique. They just use nightlight data and daylight data together at the same time. And they claim that in this way, their performance is improved. But the main idea is basically the same, to use this data to predict poverty. And I have to say, this is one kind of data set that we can use. Other people have used mobile data. And actually, in the last, uh, this week on The Economist, there was one article arguing that we could also use uh, wastewater data in order to predict population and economic uh, activity. So another paper instead that I want to discuss uh, is one of my own paper, which I wrote together with my co at the World Bank, David McKenzie. And in this paper, we were quite ambitious in the sense that we wanted to identify which firm are going to be successful. Now, I don't think I have to make the case that uh, this is an important uh, um, research question. We all know that uh, millions of firms are started every year in developing countries, and most of them, a lot of them, do not survive within the first year. So it's important to understand which firms are going to be successful, to identify them, both for investors who want to maximize their returns, but also to government officials, that maybe they want to know which firms are the most promising, in order to target them, and to maybe even give them subsidies. And finally, researchers may also be interested in knowing which characteristics are more correlated with being a successful entrepreneur. And there is a large literature trying to do that already. So what we do is we use this large business plan competition in Nigeria, where practically everybody in Nigeria could apply and could submit a proposal to create a new firm or expand an existing one. So there was an initial screening, and then the selected applicants could apply a detailed business plan proposal, which was then uh, uh, evaluated by some judges, which I have to say these judges were carefully selected, trained, they were also given support during the evaluation process. So before showing you the result, I want to emphasize that the organizer did the best uh, possible uh, in order to uh, get good uh, results in terms of judges and their evaluations. So after the judges did their work, the best one, both at the, the best firm evaluated at the national level or regional level, were the non-experimental winners and receive a relatively large amount of money, around $50,000. And then the one that were at the margin between winning and non-winning, there was some randomization going on in order to assign some of them a grant and some of them in the control group. And as you can imagine, this was done by my co-author, David McKenzie, in order to evaluate whether this business plan competition was effective. And he published one paper in the AR showing exactly that, that the grant was effective. And that therefore, in this context, credit constraint may be an important barrier to business success and survival. And that's the other reason why I like this paper, because it's a good example of how we can use uh, data that are collected for an RCT for, to answer a secondary question, uh, which is still uh, interesting. So what we want to do now, since uh, 
we will observe which firm end up surviving after three years. We also know the employment levels, sales level, and profit levels. So the first question was, did the judges do a good job? Were they able to identify which firm were successful? And then we ask ourselves, can we do better? By first using a simple heuristic model, in which we put all the basic variable that all economists will agree are correlated with business success. So we just run a simple OLS or logic model. And then in the last step, we just put everything that we know about this firm from the application process, as well as um, from the baseline survey. And we put everything into the machine learning algorithms. So to answer the first question, uh, here what we are looking is profit is on the Y is profit level after, the, after three years. And on the other axis, we have business plan score. So did the judges do a good job at evaluating this firm? The answer is not really. As you can see, the line is quite flat. Even if you drop uh, firms with zero profit, the line is still flat. We look also at employment, sales, probability of surviving, the results are very similar. And since the grant uh, was effective, that was given to winners, we evaluate winners and non-winners separately, because obviously it was a lot of money that was effective at increasing uh, business performances. But for both groups, we find very similar results. The judges were not able to uh, identify successful firms. So then we asked whether we can do better. And the answer is yes, a bit, but not that much. So as you can see here, we have no winner and winners with this firm, which was given, were given $50,000 in grants. And you have the mean squared error and the R squared. And you have the basic model, the heuristic model, and then some uh, machine learning algorithm. Now, before you jump uh, and ask that, uh, let me say that uh, this paper is a very long online appendix. We do a lot of robustness check. We try different algorithms, also ensemble models. The results are pretty much the same, which is that all models have relatively low R squared, especially for winners. This is when looking at profit, but also when we look at sales, employment, or survival, the results are very similar. And the machine learning, the mean squared error is a bit lower, but not that much. It's not amazing improvement. And what is also striking is that the relevant test, which is a basic test of cognitive ability, does quite well. And a lot of times, as well as the judges or some more complicated models. So to conclude, the result uh, in this paper are a bit disappointing in the sense that we are not able to find any model uh, which can accurately predict which firm are going to be successful. And even machine learning, where we include uh, actually hundreds and probably thousands of variables in these algorithms with possible interaction term, flexible functional form, still do not do substantially better compared to basic or heuristic models. So why this may be the case, I have different uh, hypotheses, but I think the two main driver are that first, the training sample may be too small. And I want to emphasize that uh, in the entrepreneurship literature, this is actually a huge data set. It's thousands of observations that if you ask to any venture capitalist if they would like this kind of data set, they will say, of course, yes. But for machine learning, where they're used to excel with millions of observations, a few thousand variables may not be enough to disentangle noise from signal. The other explanation may be that uh, unobservable variables may drive this result. And so even if uh, what we observe, we put all the variables with all the interaction term, 
through big quadratic terms, uh, flexible functional form is what is, if uh, what is driving firm success is unobservable, then uh, machine learning with only push you that far. You will not be able to accurately predict uh, uh, business success. So as you can imagine, uh, I was quite disappointed by this result, so I'm a bit stubborn. And with my court, uh, one of my other court, uh, the World Bank, uh, the Gender Lab, we try to explore this and go even deeper by combining data on female entrepreneurs in three different countries, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Togo. And we kind of get uh, a result consistent uh, with uh, both of these explanations, both small sample and unobservable variables. First of all, uh, when we harmonize the data across three countries in order to increase sample size, machine learning does a bit better. Again, it's not amazing, but it's relatively good. And this uh, is this also still preliminary, that's why I don't have the working paper link there. But in general, what we see is that adding a few thousand observations does make a difference. And so it helps the algorithm disentangle noise from signal. And the other interesting thing is that in one country, we have information on mobile phone transactions, such as M-Pesa or m -Pava. And we do see that these data have predictive power. So I'm kind of optimistic that in the future, where we have access to more and more different kinds of data set, then we will be able to answer more questions and get more accurate prediction in different contexts. Now you may think that, uh, okay, this result was disappointing, but maybe I did something wrong. This is an outlier, usually machine learning does amazingly. But actually, even if uh, in many cases, machine learning is great, uh, I'm a big fan of these tools. My paper is by far not the only example of machine learning not providing accurate prediction. And I think the best example is this one, which was published a few months ago, in the proceeding of National Academy of Science. And as you can see, the list of authors is very long. The reason being that in this paper, hundreds of researchers around the world were, were given the same data set, the same outcome variable. And so they were asked to, pre to predict some, uh, uh, some dependent variables such as GPA in the future, probably to being evicted, grid, and so on. And no one managed to make accurate prediction. So also in this case, the author emphasized limited sample size and an observable variable as potential driver of this result. And keep in mind that when I talk about limited sample size, also in this case, we are talking about, uh, I think, between four and 5,000 US households. So even more number of observations, which for social science uh, is quite large, but again, for machine learning may still not be enough. So before starting any project, uh, please think carefully whether or not your data is rich enough, whether you have enough observation, enough variable, observable, in order to uh, calibrate your machine learning model uh, properly. And an observable variable, uh, also in this context, may play an important role. And the author mentioned that for privacy reasons, they could not uh, uh, use genetic data. Now, I'm not saying that genetic data should always be used because there are a lot of ethical issues associated with them. But in general, my, I'm relatively optimistic because I think that, as I said, as more data are becoming available, we will be able to answer these questions in the future. So I don't think it's a close, uh, uh, it's still an open question. So I think this paper, it's a good uh, bridge between development and education because it shows that machine learning can fail in some situation but it's also in social science and some educational outcomes such as GPA. So 
So the last example that I want to discuss uh, is out of my paper, in which I use machine learning in education. And in particular, I use it to predict uh, high school dropout uh, in the US. And this paper, I published that a couple of years ago in the Oxford Bulletin of Economics and Statistics. So I started this project for several reasons. And one of the reasons is that the US high school graduation rate in the US, the graduation rate is very low and it's below the OECD average and well below the graduation rate in other developed countries such as Germany, Japan, and Finland. And what is even more striking is that you see large gap both across states, but also the gender and racial gap, which I think is very salient nowadays, given the Black Lives Matter movement. And researchers are well aware of this issue, and it has been extensively analyzed both by economists and by other social scientists. The US has also spent billions of dollars trying to solve this issue with we can discuss how, whether or not the result were good, but we all know also that the cost for individuals and society are very high. Heck, nowadays, not even having a college degree sometimes, it's enough in order to be middle-class worker. Not having even a high school diploma can have huge cost, both monetary cost and non-pecuniary benefits, and can have also negative externalities. So, Obviously, we want to solve this issue. So what I did is I tried to predict which student end up dropping out from high school using only information from ninth grade. That is when the students started high school. I wanted to do that uh, even if uh, including data from 10, 11 or 12th grade could improve the performance of my algorithm. But telling somebody that there are risks of dropping out a few months before the end of high school, maybe too late, for instance, for them to catch up with mathematics. And so I wanted to create an algorithm which predicts individual at risk at the beginning of high school before it's too late. So parents, teacher, counselor, and student themselves can act before it's too late. And I was excited by far the school nowadays in the US but in many other developing countries and developed one have huge data available to them that can efficiently exploit using machine learning. And doing this, I will show you lead to better performances compared to using some basic model. And when I started this project, I was actually a PhD student at Georgetown and my advisor kind of forced me to put some economic theory in this paper, which at the beginning, I was a bit reluctant because I mainly do empirical work, but ex post, I'm very grateful that she did because I think it's a valuable contribution to this paper. I will show you that I can write an economic model to justify which criteria you should use in order to evaluate different uh, algorithms and calibrate them. And I think this is one area in which economists can contribute this literature. Now, I don't think I have time, but at the end of the paper, I also do some unsupervised machine learning. And in this section, what I do is that, uh, okay, now I know which students are at risk by this result from the supervised machine learning paper uh, algorithm. But these students may be at risk because of different reasons. Some students may be academically weak. Some students may have behavioral issue and some students may have issue at home. And so unsupervised machine learning could allow me to cluster students into different groups. And so maybe instead of putting all of them in the same dropout prevention program, you could assign different treatment to each of them or maybe even a, a narcity randomized control trial in each of the, these different uh, subgroups.
So uh, the other reason actually why I started this project is that I was kind of annoyed when I started to read this literature that what school in the US were doing at the time, now it's a bit better, but at the time we were using only three indicators in order to predict a high school dropout, which is attendance, school behavior, and GPA. And if you read the, the uh, US Department of Education documents, they admit that there is minimal empirical evidence for this suggestion, but they were still doing this early warning system in which they use few data to predict high school dropout. And that's uh, striking the, given the fact that this school uh, have huge data available to them and they could use them to actually correctly identify thousands of additional students who are at risk of dropping out and therefore helping them. So you may wonder, okay, you can uh, get better prediction, but why would I care about this? So I think the first ask well, to that is that I think parents will appreciate whether or not you send a text message saying, hey, your, your child is at risk of dropping out, your teenager. Uh, but also school counselors are usually overloaded in the US with hundreds of students assigned to them, especially in large school. So we could assign them, uh, uh, flag them which students are at risk using these algorithms and therefore save some time and reduce errors. And that's one way in which I think machine learning could work together with human experts. And finally, if instead you are more interested in knowing which program are effective at reducing dropout, in this way, with this algorithm, you could first identify your subpopulation of interest, the one at risk, and then run one or more RCT in order to understand which programs can help them. So the bottom line is that I don't think machine learning is a substitute for econometric analysis. I don't think we need to forget everything that we learn in our first and second year PhD econometric class. I really think that there are a complementary tool that can be used together with econometric analysis in order to enforce them and to answer new questions as well as to answer better some causal inference uh, questions. So going to the data, what I use uh, just before showing the result is this data set collected by the US Department of Education in 2009. So it's relatively recent. And here students around all of the US were interviewed in ninth grade and again in 11th grade and in college. So I know which student ended up dropping out from high school. And they also, during this survey, they also interviewed the, the parents, some of the teacher, the school administrator, and the school counselor. So it's a very rich data set. They really have a lot of information about these students. I even have the SAT, which is usually uh, private uh, information. And the other cool thing about this data set is that it's about millennials. It's about a new cohort of students, which is in contrast with the previous literature, which mainly for better reason focus on uh, older cohort. And so this may be more relevant for policymakers nowadays since it's a more recent cohort. So before showing you the result, we have to agree on which criteria we want to use to compare different model and you know, to decide which one, which model is the best. So if this were a continuous outcome, then not everybody, but most people would agree that what we need to do is to minimize the mean squared error. Then we can also discuss that, but it's not the point of the paper. The point here is that with a binary outcome, when in this case, we have dropout, yes, one, or graduate, yes, zero. Uh, as we learn from our econometric classes, there are many different uh, ways in which we can evaluate the performance of these algorithms, or even also logic or probability. We can compare our model to a simple model with just a constant, 
And this is the idea behind the cell R squared or the McFadden R squared. Alternatively, what you can do is to compare correct and incorrect prediction, which is something that I prefer in this context because it really makes clear that there is a type one and type two error. You could incorrectly predict somebody to graduate even if they end up dropping out, or you could incorrectly predict somebody to uh, drop out even if they graduate. And both of them have different, this kind of error have different costs. So you want to treat them differently. So what, if you read the computer science literature, what people usually do is to maximize the accuracy rate, which is the percentage of correct prediction. That is the percentage of correct zeros plus correct ones plus correct zeros over the total number of observations. That is the total number of students correctly predicted to graduate or correctly predicted to drop out over the total number of observations. The problem here is that my data set is unbalanced. As I said, the graduation rate in the US is low, but it's not that low. It's not 50-50. So the number of zeros is much larger than the number of ones. And so even a simple model predicting everybody to graduate will have a very high accuracy rate. So this criteria in this context, is, it's quite misleading. So what people usually do is to use different kinds of criteria, such as the color rate, the specificity, the area under the rock curve. And different criteria have their own pros and cons. For instance, the color rate is the share of people correctly predicted to drop out over the total number of people who ended up dropping out. And in the previous literature, especially in computer science, Researchers mainly just pick one or two criteria when they wanted to maximize some objective uh, function in education without really justifying why they chose one criteria instead of the other. And here as an economist, actually, we can contribute to that because we can say, okay, let me take a step back, write an economic model, and see based on this economic model which method makes sense. And in this context, the one that the goodness of fit criteria that makes sense is the color rate. So I won't go into details uh, into the model. You can see that uh, in the paper, but basically uh, reading uh, the state and federal legislation in the US, it makes sense to think that what school want to do is to minimize the expected dropout rate subject to some budget constraint. Now, we can agree that school may have different objective function that they may also include some equity consideration. For instance, they may want to treat uh, minority students differently given the historically high dropout rate. And I discussed this in the paper. There is also large literature on fairness, which has also been mentioned in the previous seminar. But my point here is more general. Before starting uh, any model, any algorithm, think which criteria makes sense for you to maximize. It may not be the color rate, it may be, those, may be something else, but at least justify which one makes sense in your context. And so in this case, if we think that this objective function makes sense, then school wants to identify which student are at risk of dropping out, in order to put them in a dropout prevention program. And the intuition here is that uh, there are two kinds of error. Some students uh, may be predicted to drop out even if they end up graduating. In this case, there are some costs in the sense that the school spend some cost, some money to put them into some dropout prevention program even if the student may still benefit since they may still be weak. Uh, the students may get a negative signal, but overall the cost for the other kind of error, which is to predict somebody to graduate, even if they end up dropping out, are much larger, both for the individual and the society. 
And so you can imagine that since one error is so much worse compared to the other, we want to minimize that error subject to the budget constraint. So we want to limit student at risk of being misclassified and therefore to maximize the recall rate while respecting some budget constraint. Since obviously we cannot put everybody into a dropout prevention program because we don't have the money to do that and it will not be efficient. So the key message here is that uh, as economists, write a model and think uh, um, which goodness of fit criteria makes sense for you to use to compare and calibrate your model. And also, since now there are dozen of uh, off-the-shelf algorithms which you can use by just running one line in Stata, Python, R, or MATLAB, please read the documentation and check that what uh, the algorithm are using automatically to calibrate the model makes sense in your application. Because otherwise you may get that machine learning does not do well, but it's because they are targeting something which is not your objective. So jumping to the result, uh, what you see here is the result for the heuristic model, either logit or less or probit where I put some basic variable, which again, as uh, in the Nigeria case, most economists will agree are correlated with uh, success in school. And the recall rate is, is quite low. And so most students will not be identified as being at risk of dropping out using this model, which again, I want to emphasize it's even better than what school used to do at that time, which is only using three predictors, GPA, behavior, and attendance. And this poor result has been found also in other studies in this literature. So I'm not the only one uh, finding this. So what you can do is actually since this data set is very rich, which again is very similar to what school have available to them in the US. I can put everything I know from the students, the teacher, the parents, the school principal, and the counselor into the machine learning algorithm. And I don't even have to decide which kind of interaction to add, which quadratic term or cubic term to add. The machine learning algorithm will decide which one to include, which one are the most powerful predictor. And this is better than what some researchers did in previous paper when they had a lot of variable, they used principal component analysis in order to reduce the dimensionality. Now, I think you can add uh, the predictor from principal component analysis among your predictor together with the original predictor, but just put using principal component analysis is not ideal in this situation. Because this technique, what what it's doing is to summarize the joint distribution of certain variables. It's not trying to find the best signal, the best predictor given a set of variables. It's not the objective of the tool. And so you can expect uh, using this technique that you may get suboptimal performances. And again, you don't have to do this. You don't have to reduce the dimensionality of your data set. Machine learning is designed to use that, to do that. So what I did, uh, once I get all the machine learning uh, algorithm, again, also in this case, don't focus too much on which algorithm I use. I have again, a very long online appendix with uh, different robustness checks. But overall, uh, some algorithm or the other, but all of them lead to better performances compared to the uh, basic uh, predictors. Which, okay, the recall rate uh, is not 100%, but remember I was not expecting 100% because I'm using only information from ninth grade. And so there are a lot of things that can happen in 10th grade, 11th grade or 12th grade, which may lead some student to dropping out. But still, Despite this limitation, I get relatively large improvement. It's a 50% improvement compared to a basic model, which 
if implemented to a national level, will lead to thousands of students correctly predicted to uh, be at risk. And so teachers and parents could help the students uh, before it is too late. And really, that's all I have. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to see all your comments and feedbacks. Thanks, Daria, for this nice talk. I think uh, so. A question comes to my mind as when you do this type of analysis, interpreting some coefficients or implementing some policies. Of course, some people resist these type of ideas because of privacy or fairness or so on. And there is this famous book. Weapons of math destruction, how big data increases inequality, and these type of things. Like, what do you tell, like, in general, about these topics? Yeah, so in the paper, I actually uh, include a list of predictors because that's what a lot of people uh, always ask me at seminars, and we do that also in Nigeria. I think it's okay to look at this list of predictors. Keep in mind that there are predictors. There is nothing causal going on. I'm not saying that if I see certain things that you do at home are uh, predicting of dropping out, that means that not doing this can affect your probability of dropping out. But it's really interesting to look at this predictor. And I think why it is interesting is that, especially in developing country, well, maybe you have more limited data and you're thinking, okay, which variable should I collect? Then you can start some pilot survey, seeing which variable are the most powerful predictor and then collect those variables. Then I think it's a useful way to use this list of predictors that algorithms such as lasso or boosting give you. And the other caveat that I want to emphasize is that even if some variables are selected by the algorithm and others are not selected, that does not mean that the other variables are not powerful predictors because they may be highly correlated with the list of predictors that uh, you have obtained. And so the one that you get from the algorithm, you know that are highly predicted, but you cannot exclude that there are some other variables that are predicted. But again, if you're interested in prediction, you don't care that uh, variable A or B are predicted to gender and gender is not included. You just want to collect uh, some variable which have predictive, which have predictive power. Then uh, if you do causal estimate instead, obviously you want to include certain variable, but the objective are different. And I think you also mentioned uh, and Yesterday, also in the insurance talk, uh, the speaker mentioned the fact that sometimes uh, we cannot include some variables in the algorithm. And I think that Mulanatan and Koto have done a lot of work on what can you do in terms of fairness and whether or not it makes sense to exclude some variable. And I think their take uh, is that unless you are legally obliged to exclude certain variables such as race, it's better to include everything into your own algorithm and then use a different threshold for different subgroup of the population before getting your prediction, you know, to adjust for your equity consideration. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. So I'm looking for questions or chat. Thank you, Brad. Mm -hmm. Nice. And a couple of <laughs> nice political here. So I think that's all. Patrick is here. We can welcome him. And I don't know whether he prefers to give a couple of minutes break or thank you, Tarja. Everything. Thanks again. Let me just stop sharing. And thanks again for inviting me.
I am, I think Patrick, now from Italy, we went to Vancouver. And I don't know, Patrick is trying to connect, but hi, Patrick. It's maybe an internet connection. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, Patrick. So we can hear you. Yes. Hi. Hey, everybody. We move from Italy to Vancouver, one side of the world, the other side. Welcome. Right. Okay. Flying across time zones. Um, do you want to give me like three minutes to get set up and then we'll yes. start? Yes. Uh, for everyone, I think we can start at one anyway. We finished early. So everyone can have 10 minutes refreshment break, I can guess. And we can start at one. Yes. OK. So as everyone heard, we can connect and come back at one o'clock, I think, and it's a couple of minutes. Okay. So let's meet at one o'clock.